us from other states and other areas. And I'm very pleased to welcome Michael Ronkin and Todd Boulanger from the city of Vancouver. And just remember to speak into the microphone. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Robert, for such a short introduction. That way we can talk more about what we're here to talk about. Um, the way this session is going to run is going to be very interesting. We're going to be asking the audience to participate. We are basically going to be asking a series of questions based on some slides. And we're going to want to move through these fairly fast. So this is how it's going to go. We're going to show you about a half dozen slides of some interesting, let's put it that way, road treatments, most of them from Holland, but not necessarily. Quite a few are from Switzerland. And then we'll ask you a series of questions, and we're going to ask you to tell us whether or not you think these kind of treatments could work in the U.S. If so, why don't we do them? And if not, what would it take to make them work in the U.S.? Do we even want them to work in the U.S.? And we're going to try to limit it to about five minutes per session. We've got about 14 subjects in all. We'd like to cover them all. But before that, I would like to have uh, Todd explain to us what credentials he has to be an expert on Dutch bicycle and pedestrian treatments. Actually, no cr credentials. Um, <laughs> Uh, just cycling and uh, traveling a lot by bicycle in Asia, the Netherlands, um, United States, and actually minimizing my car use. Well, my credentials are much greater than his. I actually have a certificate. It's called a marriage certificate. I'm married to a Dutch woman. She's right here, Andrea. <laughs> You'll be seeing her on quite a few slides. But the same thing. I've been going to Harlem fairly regularly over the last 20 years and just observing what they're doing there. I did grow up in Switzerland, and you'll see quite a few slides from my hometown in Geneva. So with that, I just said we get started. So the less time we spent talking about what we're going to talk about instead of just getting right into it, the more time we'll have. And uh, I do not expect to be disappointed by this audience. Last time we did this, it was absolutely overwhelming. We actually had to cut discussions short so we could keep moving on. So like I said, these are the five basic questions. Now, don't be intimidated. This is not like a quiz. You have to go one, two, three, four, five, answer all those questions. You can't move on to the next one. It's just to give you an idea of what we would like to provoke in the way of a dialogue. Why does it work there? Will it work in the U.S.? If so, or if not, why not? What would it take to make it work here, like legislative changes, changes in attitudes, changes in pricing, whatever you can think of? And more provocatively, are there any examples in the U.S.? And the answer to that, I can tell you right now, is going to be yes on quite a few. And we'll show you a few examples where such treatments have been applied in the United States. We're going to go through ten bicycle treatments. Don't have to memorize them. And about five pedestrian treatments. Don't have to memorize them. We'll go through them one at a time. So to start off, we want to dispel a couple of myths. First of all, how many of you have been to Holland? How many of you who, who raised their hands rode their bikes in Holland? All right, all hands stayed up. Very good. It is an absolute myth that all bicycling in Holland occurs on paths. A lot of people do share the roads. As a matter of fact, when we gave this presentation on Pro Bike, remember Todd, someone said he saw an estimate that from the Dutch government that 75% of all bicycling occurs like this on a shared roadway. Yet it's the path system that people tend to remember the best because it is such a marvelous system. Don't get me wrong. Another myth is that it's always been that way. Holland has always had a lot of cyclists, but it wasn't until they realized they had a crisis on their hands in the late 60s, early 70s, that they could no longer accommodate bicyclists comfortably on the roadway because the automobile was growing in popularity. So they did have to do something conscientious about it. And starting in the late 60s, early 70s, they did want to see things turn around. The amount of bicycling was declining. The amount of driving was going up. So it was a concerted effort all across Holland to try to reestablish the counterbalance that they had had previously without the facilities. That's just by way of introduction to the topic so people don't think that Holland has always had paths and paths are the only way that people happen to be riding a bike in Holland. So we're going to start off with the one that people ask us the most about. I think you know that we do have some two-way cycle paths in the United States, in Oregon, next to roads, and they frankly haven't always been very successful. And yet you go to Holland and they provide paths next to roadways, and they seem to work quite well. For example, this picture right here, can you tell us why this path works quite well and would it work in the U.S.? Separated from the roadway. Yeah, it's separated from the roadway, right. No conflicts, right. It's next to water. Robert did ask you to push down on the microphone so people can hear. I'm not going to do the Oprah thing and run around. Hold it the whole time you're talking? Okay, thanks very much. 
Same here, right? You don't see many conflicts. But as you get closer to urban areas, you do see some conflicts arising. There are driveways coming onto these paths. And you actually see them sometimes in very urban areas, too, with one very subtle difference. It's no longer a two-way path. You will rarely see a two-way path on the side of a street if it's a very urban street like this. You can barely make it out, but there is a parallel path on the other side. So these are one-way facilities. They do have special ways of treating intersections so that they do reduce the conflicts. And a little subtle thing here, you can see these loop detectors. It's pretty amazing. If this light is red, because the traffic signal has released traffic coming from the side road, and you approach on a bicycle, it will turn it to red for the vehicle traffic and green for the path at such rates you barely have to slow down. So they really go out of the way to make sure that if you're riding, you can ride continuously without any interruptions. So with that, we're going to open it to debate, and Todd's going to be our timekeeper here. We're going to try to keep it to about four minutes of questions and debate per subject area, so we have five minutes total so we can move on. So like I said, just jump in anytime. Think about why it works in Holland, why we don't have much success with paths in America, what we do to make them work better, or is it just something inherently about the way the Dutch are that we can't mimic? Uh, just, looking at, just looking at that picture, I can imagine it could work in uh, the Springwater Corridor Trail in Portland. It could work. So we could put in a device like this. Okay. So it's just, are you saying is it, it's an engineering feature? Yeah, I think it's about political willpower. I think it's about our politicians making a decision to um, put bicycles first, and you know, and make the cars yield to them. And everything's designed now for cars first, basically. Okay, so the political will to change the rules of the road, would you say, even or just? Attitude? Yes, I would say that. Okay, great. Can you, yeah, find a microphone. That's it. That should work. Yeah. Uh, related to that, I think. Uh, um, Although you didn't have so many bicycle lanes in, in the Netherlands uh, in the post-war period to begin with, you, always, you had a lot of cyclists, and so you had a built-in constituency uh, that would be supportive of bicycle facilities. Here, we're starting out with a pretty small <coughs> percentage of people who are, who are actively bicycling, so much less uh, support to really spend a lot of money on that sort of system. That, that's an excellent point, yeah. When I was in Holland, I noticed that cars were much less aggressive in the way they drove and people moved in much less aggressive ways even in Amsterdam what was really congested and I think that's a challenge here even when people get on their bike they're kind of used to being in a rush and trying to get places they have a tendency to run signs and all this other type of stuff and I think that these type of separated paths give people a sense of sometimes false security especially in busy places and um, I think that's probably one of the big challenges for them is that sort of cultural issue. Great. So, yeah, political willpower, cultural, that was kind of cultural also. That's a really good point. How many of you who did ride paths in Holland felt threatened at every driveway? How about in the United States? Yeah. So I, yeah, that's a very good point. Right. Jump in. Yeah. The motorized, the mopeds and so on, do they share the bike paths <laughs> or not? Theoretically, they're not supposed to, but they do. Yeah. Is that, is that a significant chunk of two-wheel vehicles, you know? It, it can be an annoyance, yeah. Okay. There's a difference in, in, in size of the motor. Uh, I'm not technical, but you have little mopeds that go on the roads for the bicycles, and then the bigger ones that come in a category of small motorcycles uh, are supposed to go on the road. And I just read in the paper that, uh, I read the Dutch paper online, that the smaller ones are being phased out. Could not quite figure out why. Is that the small moped with the engine strapped on no, the No, vehicle? no, no, that's... Uh, the 49cc? Yeah. Okay. That is strapped on, that's okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> well, I think one of the things I've noticed about two-way bike paths here in Portland is that they're primarily oriented towards uh, recreation, not transportation, and that um, a lot of times, although the Springwater Corridor does look a lot like this in some places, um, they're not close enough to roads so that people who would be driving would maybe even know there was a bike path there. They're more placed off into the forest area, so they're, you know, they've got a good scenic view, but they're not necessarily easily recognizable as a transportation option. Thanks. That's a really good point. And, I, and there's one point that is not really easy to capture. I'd like to ask you. And think about the different environment, Holland. I'll give you a hint. 22 million people in a country the size of New Jersey, 
Oregon, three million people in a state half the size of France or Germany. What kind of conclusion does that lead you as far as land use goes in the success of a facility like this? I, I think it's land use in, in the big states, but also land use in the small states with sprawl. You know, land use in the big states, how many paths can we, can we make and can we make good transportation for? But in the small states, it's, you know, you, there's a lot of land is already used and there's big battles over getting the space to build the paths. So, you know, sprawl becomes an issue. So we've already taken up a lot of this available space, yeah? Well, um, I'm sorry, but it's clear that density is much higher in, in um, well, anywhere but the western U.S. And um, I wonder how long like people's average commute you'd compare in Holland and the U.S. Okay, yeah, really good point. How long is the average commute? And I'll give you the hint here. If you ride these kind of paths in Holland, it's absolutely amazing. I would say on average, every six to seven minutes you come to a village or so. And they really are spaced three to four kilometers apart. So working for the DOT, I get asked very often, how come we don't develop a trail system in the Willamette Valley even, linking up all the cities together? And you realize, you know, it's 20 miles Salem to Albany, 15 miles Albany to Corvallis, 40 miles Corvallis to Eugene, with not a whole lot in between, really. Yeah, so you're right. The, the commute distances are a lot shorter. Okay, one more, then we'll move on to the next subject. Yeah, but this is a good one to start the discussion. With. I'm sorry, he had his hand up first. With it. Yeah. Okay. The point that hasn't been made yet is funding. Uh, we work. All the local communities and agencies are playing catch up with safety and capacity related problems for things that we should have been able to fix decades ago, and. <laughs> to build the sort of infrastructure you're talking about, we'd have to take money from something else that may be a safety-related problem or come up with more money, which has been a problem in several states lately. Yeah, that's such an obvious one. I'm surprised no one caught that. Right. It is very, very expensive. I mean, we build these kind of facilities, and we know how much they cost to provide. Absolutely right, yeah. It's not just the building, it's the maintenance. Well, yeah, the total cost, the right. Right. Good, and that's actually a good thought I think we can bear throughout this. I think for one that's coming up in a couple of minutes, too, you'll see how relevant that question is. Oh, well, this one right here. Another reason why paths tend to be very successful there is they do a very good job of separation when you're crossing a busy roadway. They're on the cr crossings of big, they're open, they're well lit, they're not at all intimidating, they get a lot of use, and they find ways of making sure that people feel secure in them. In the U.S., this is one of the better examples that I've ever seen of a pretty open undercrossing. It helps that there's snow with a lighting. Here's the best example I've ever seen anywhere. The University of Colorado in Boulder has got a very nice undercrossing under a highway. This is one of the ways how they get light down there. You'll see the shaft of light coming through. Um, nice murals on the side. And something else that they did, too, they elevated the highway about three or four feet so that you're not really going down into a tunnel. From the surface, you can pretty much see through what's happening on the other side. So this time we'll ask the questions with a U.S. example up there. Obviously, I don't think it's a technical issue. We know how to do something like this, and yet some of the over and under crossings that we build are nowhere near this attractive. So something tells me we've already answered this question partially with a couple of the answers that we got here, but anything else that you might want to add to that? Well, this is something like this is happening right now in the Dalles, <coughs> where they're breaching I-84. Mm -hmm. um, the Union Street connects uh, essentially the Dalles and runs north right now into 84, but we'll be going underneath 84 and linking to the Columbia River, and it'll have a series of bike lanes on either side. And it's a super enhanced opening that looks from the street like a building facade, and as you approach through it, it's backlit with glass block walls to create a really sort of vibrant open space and then linking you right to the river. So. It took some tweaking with ODOT, but uh, you know it's certainly <laughs> being built idea, today. Give an idea of the price tag. Uh, no, I don't, right offhand, but several million, of course. Several million. It's probably not off. Well over a million, yeah. Um, an issue that I've encountered with undercrossings of the few I've seen here locally, um, well, it's more of a pedestrian issue. So I don't know how much pedestrians use the paths in in Holland, if it's just mainly bicyclists, because I've not been there. Um, mm -hmm. But I know with undercrossing, sometimes an issue is safety and feeling like you can kind of move through and, you know, and feel safe. So. Yeah. Well, pedestrians do use a pass. Let me just flip back real quick to that Dutch example of how incredibly wide it was. And I think, Todd, you took that picture. I think that there's also almost separation. Yeah, see there's a pedestrian way and a path for the bicyclist, right? 
I guess one, two comments would be you notice that on the Dutch ones there's no graffiti, so there's a different <laughs> cultural uh, use for the undercrossings, and it's a rare U.S. undercrossing that doesn't have graffiti. Yeah. Yeah. Took these pictures. What I mean, I've seen a lot of graffiti in Holland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think I took this picture the day after they cleaned it. Okay. <laughs> And then the, the second comment would be, um, in Salem, we tried to do at uh, the undercrossing uh, on Front Street, connecting the park with downtown, and that meant into resistance because it was impinging on businesses. They thought that it was taking away parking. And so there's other non-technical issues that preclude using undercrossings. Okay. Good. Yeah. I know a lot of U.S. pedestrian undercrossings, at least, can feel like really sketchy places. People are obviously sleeping and peeing there, and you don't really feel like you want to be there at night alone. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. <laughs> right. So we, yeah, we just don't build them to a standard that makes them well, comfortable. And it's like the, the um, eyes on the street. If people mm -hmm. don't use it very often, right. you don't feel safe right. going. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. One, two. Um, to amplify what you were saying, there frequently. Um, you go down, and when it's raining, there's usually a lake down there. <laughs> there's sometimes people sleeping, there's urine, there's leftover things there. And they were designed for a person to walk through, like you have to go under the train tracks or something like that. And they've been retrofitted, maybe, to let bikes pass through easier. But it's not convenient at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Todd tells me the timekeeper, we need to move on, so give him the dirty looks if you had a question that we're not going to, I mean a comment that we're not going to take. Okay, the next one is more of a traffic engineering feature. Some of you may be familiar with, there are a couple here in Portland, and there's been quite a bit of pressure put on different traffic engineering uh, uh, agencies around the country to try to do this, and that's the advanced bike box. What this does is enables you as a cyclist to pull up to a signalized intersection, and if the light is red and cars are starting to queue up, you can pass them on your right and pull ahead into a box. This is an unusual one. It's for both going left and right or straight through. But this is the very classic situation here. So you can see what happens. Up to a dozen bicyclists or so can wait up there at the light. And even the ones here on the right will most likely be able to proceed before this car ever moves because the bicyclist clear and as the box clear as you can get in there with your bicycle too. So it is a way of giving the bicyclist a head start, literally, at an intersection where the light turns green instead of one after the other waiting behind cars and things like that. So there's been a lot of uh, requests to try to get something like this to work, to, to be built in the United States, and there's a couple of reasons that I know of why they haven't been built and like to hear from you what ideas you have. Touching on the social issue of driving, you'd have to train American drivers not to pull all the way into the sidewalk on the other side of the street <laughs> at the intersection. <laughs> okay, so we're back to the drivers. That's been mentioned several times, yeah. Uh, I can think of, I don't know, some technical issues. I don't know if they're allowed to make right turns on red in Very Holland good. That's, that's It's a legal one, right? There is um, no right on red. That's we're not one. allowed to pass on the right technically on a bicycle, so you'd have to have a bike lane on the street to get to the bike box right. in the first uh, place. I might forget, you, you're addressing several points. Let me just one at a time. So okay. you have to ride on both. No right on red. Yeah, uh, the bike box, as far as I can tell, has always been associated with a bike lane. I mean, I've never seen a bike box without the bike lane. So you're given that passage. So we could do it. There's nothing that prevents us from doing that part. Go ahead. You had a third point, I thought? Yeah. Uh, I guess the third point was about aggressive motorists not uh, being too happy with this situation, yeah. yeah. which I think right. are waiting. I'd, I'd say Jeff? probably I suspect there's a lack of pre-existing uh, engineering standards that say how you do it, when you do it, what, what the application is, and the reluctance to try one without some sort of national standard. Good point, yeah. Um, for those of you listening and didn't hear, there are really no, no real standards in the United States for something like that. So an engineer may be hesitant to do something that he can't go to a book and say, this is how you do it, this is where you do it. Give the mic. I saw at the Morrison Bridge meeting the other night that they had proposed one if they choose to do the Alder Street on-ramp. And Jeff, do you know anything about how they designed that, if it's similar to this? I, I haven't looked at that one okay. closely. I'm wondering if there's some vehicle code uh, issues involved with, you know, lane changing. I mean, if you assume a bicyclist is, is under the same jurisdiction as motor vehicles, that kind of lane changing at the last second might be a minor issue that needs to be tinkered with. Um, it's not a last second thing. If the light, if, if traffic is moving, you don't get into the bike box. You only get in the bike box when it's red. Right. Um, 
Another thing that a lot of European signals have, believe it or not, and you'd think they'll be absolutely horrendous, they've actually got a red, yellow, green, and you're not allowed to proceed until it's green. So if it is turning red, yellow, green, you know that traffic is going to be moving, and you would not get into that box. But I, I see your point. You would, yeah, you'd hesitate to move in the box as traffic was moving. It's only occupied when traffic is stopped. But yeah, um, but it is designated for bicyclists. As far as the legality of it, it is designed with that in mind, that you move out here, and you, I guess it's a lane change in a way, yeah. Good points. Yeah, I'm Rich, and then Roger. Maybe uh, one sort of unpopular comment in this room, but uh, I think a true one is uh, many cyclists don't stop for red lights, mm -hmm. and um, there's going to be a public perception there that uh, why should expense and changes to traffic engineering standards be made mm -hmm. for a group that isn't obeying the traffic laws in the first place. And I think there's a lot of reasons why cyclists don't. Um, uh, to be fair to them, but uh, there's certainly that perception out there, and there's certainly some reason for it. Okay, one more, Roger, and then we need to move on. Sorry. Yeah, I think for them to work, you also have to have a density of use. You have to have a lot of yeah. cyclists who will use it, so motorists become accustomed to seeing them in the bike box. Great. So far, Todd, we ended up jumping once. All right. Since he's my wife, I'll make an exception. Go ahead. I think you might want to add that uh, traffic does stop at an intersection a little bit longer. That's, that's a good point. Delays tend to be longer, right? So there is more of a reason to do it, right? Okay, the other one is colored bike lanes. Uh, I've heard recently this is a standard. All new bike lanes in Holland are colored, and they're retrofitting them. Uh, the existing ones, they definitely used a lot at intersections to try to notify drivers that there will be something coming up. We have had a few examples in the U.S. that have not been too successful. It's about five years after we stained this one. This is one that's absolutely brand new. This is actually a combination of the median and the bike lanes for traffic calming. This is in Terrebonne, Oregon, on Highway 97. It's an unincorporated community where people are doing about 50 in the 35-mile-an-hour zone. So doing different things to try to slow traffic down. And, yes, we definitely have some U.S. examples, as you know very well, in Portland and Salem, too, where we've gone out and colored a bike lane just at an intersection. So let's open it up. Yes. Can you try to, can someone close try to get a mic or? Okay. Can just stand up? A lot of the ones they've done here tend to be painted. And, of course, in this climate, when it rains, they're very slippery. Um, what are some of the others that you've seen or what seems to be the They're all dyed in the asphalt. They are dyed in the asphalt. So you do a separate overlay passage for the bike lane with dyed asphalt. So it's, it has the same surface texture as asphalt. It was simultaneous, so <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's the compliance of this versus a non-marked lane? Uh, how do you ask the question, like, do bicycles stay in the lane or does cars stay out of cars, it? Cars, what's the, how, how much better or is there any statistical significance to the compliance of the drivers to the bicycles? I see what you're saying, right. Uh, I don't know if that's the reason. I, th I mean, you're looking here in Holland. Because here. What's the reason for doing it? The reason is to make the roads look narrower. Really, the reason is to make the roads look narrow. We'll show you some other treatments where they're decaying an existing roadway without changing the roadway width. They're doing things with coloring and markings to make the road look narrower. But this is set up specifically this, to show where the bicycles are supposed yeah, to Yeah, this go. is the Portland example, right? This is the Broadway Bridge. Uh, Roger can answer that one if you don't why it was done is, here. These, these were set up in areas where there's uh, going to be a bicycle-automobile conflict and it's designed to give the right-of-way to the bike. And uh, yes, we found that there is a, a statistical significance in terms of cars yielding to bikes um, when they approach these blue bike lanes. I don't work for the city of Portland, but I know that they had to move heaven and earth to get a few blue bike lanes in on the streets. And the reason <laughs> is uh, they're outside the universe of approved traffic control devices. And so I'd like to ask you guys, is it easier in Holland to do these sort of uh, what we would call experimental treatments, or did they all, do they also have this sort of extreme bureaucracy for things like this? Uh, bureaucracy is not unique to the United States, I can tell you that. And uh, 
No, they have, I mean, they have the same rigorous standards, too. They don't just willy-nilly go out there and put in paint and things like that and say, hey, let's see how this works. There is no doubt that they go through fairly rigorous experimenting, too. They have a much larger pool, of course, of areas where they can experiment with it. But in direct answer to your question, I think you might have seen the latest memo from Ed Fisher, state traffic engineer. We are not considering painted bike lanes traffic control devices. The traffic control device is the paint on either side and the stencil. If you color the pavement, that we think that is not covered in the METCD. So I think we've got a really fairly liberal, open-minded traffic engineer who's more willing to look at this now. I think, yeah. How well are the seen at night in Holland? Or are there any other ways of making them visible at night? Um, I have to go back. They, they still use the paint. It's just, it's really more of a daytime thing. There's no doubt about that. I mean, now you can see that the, the red there is pretty washed out, but they're, they're still pretty heavily painted. So they're still very reliant on that white or yellow line separating the traffic and the bikes for that visibility at night. Yeah, and they're experimenting with different thermoplastics and such as we are here. Yeah, maybe one more and then move on. Do you use retroreflective paint in Holland? I know in Oregon we really don't very mm -hmm. often, but there, some of us would like to yeah. uh, convert to using retroreflective every I, I don't think that much. No, I don't remember them being that particular bright in urban areas. No. Or even the um, pavement stones. Right, yeah. If anything, they tend to be a little bit duller almost sometimes. Okay, next one. Uh, what is next? Okay, separate signals for bikes, mostly at junctures with a separated path, or not necessarily, even with bike lanes. And the idea is uh, there's a phase for traffic, sometimes a separate phase for bikes and for pedestrians. And uh, here's one with one for pedestrians and one for bicycles. It's usually concurrent, but not necessarily. Uh, here's some other examples right here. So there's quite a few. There's the bike signal. And this is what it looks like close up. And we did find uh, some U.S. examples. Of course, there was one in Holland, uh, Holland, Portland that may come back in again. But this is one in Davis where cyclists get their own signal. All traffic is held, and the cyclists do get to go through the intersection. By the way, notice that? I just noticed that a couple of days ago. They're sharing a pair of skates between two people. <laughs> you know, you look at the same slide a dozen, two dozen times, and you look a little bit more closely, and it's like, what's going on here? So I thought, I thought that was cute, yeah. So, don't need to repeat these. Let's just open up for discussion. Yeah, Roger? Uh, yeah, this, I think this would work in the U.S., and we do have one in Portland at the intersection of Broadway and Lovejoy. Um, the, the reason why they may not be widely used is, is cost, I think. That's what we're running into um, here, where we've identified the need for some intersections where we'd like to see bike signals, and we just can't afford it right now. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, if you're up close, get there. Yeah. I, I think the biggest, I think the biggest <laughs> problem is the, how fast we can get the signals to actually activate. Um, when I was in Britain recently, they had an intersection close to a close to a train station and you push the button as a pedestrian and you get a gr you get a red light implemented right away and the cars come to a screeching halt and I think one of the frustrations as a pedestrian here in the states is that, you know they just have little buttons that you push at the intersections that you know you, do, you really question whether they have any effect at all <laughs> One of the interesting kind of side notes about this that I noticed in Holland and I have photographs of is that there were times when the car's light was yellow and the bike's light was green and vice versa. Like, it wasn't always that one was stopped. It was sometimes, hey, be cautious because you're in a dangerous uh, pattern or, 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 t t or potentially dangerous uh, traffic pattern right now. Hold that thought because on the pedestrian section coming up in about 25 minutes, we'll deal with an issue exactly like that. So hold that thought, yeah. I would have thought that the biggest objection to the separate signals would be the delay. There you go. Uh, yeah. There was an intersection where Beaverton was mm -hmm. considering a left turn light, and they turned it down because of the right. longer traffic phase right. that that would have created. Uh, what's really interesting about that is longer delay for the bicyclists. I'll be really honest. At one of those, I got kind of impatient. I waited as a cyclist, but it adds delay to the cyclist, too, because when the traffic is moving, you're not allowed to move either. So instead of just left and right, left and right, you know, two cycles or maybe three to left turn, it can be up to four phases at some of these signals, like through traffic, then turning traffic, then traffic in the other direction, and then bicyclists get released. Yeah, so it's more delay for everybody. You're absolutely right. Um, we'll take one more. Then we need to move on. The gentleman in the back hasn't had a um, chance yet. Can you find a microphone? Yeah, thanks. Isn't the whole point of doing this to integrate 
at the bicyclist into traffic, if you make a separate life for the cyclist, you're basically creating a what you might call a separate but equal system, which is never completely equal. So if, if you try to make a separate system for bicycles in traffic, you're actually kind of reducing the, uh, uh, the ability to be in traffic. That is, you're supposed to be part of traffic rather than a separate unit in traffic. Okay. These are these are not done at every intersection. You understand that, right? Just where there is a path or very complex situation, right? And I think that ties into the comment we just made about delay. You are disadvantaging everybody. Okay, one more, then we'll move on. Yeah. Try. Well, I, I, I think that a lot of the things we're looking at in Holland are based on kind of separate infrastructure, and I think that it's in the U.S. that us relatively few serious cyclists want to be vehicular cyclists, want to be included in the regular system, and I think we're looking at a different paradigm. But, but also, what you're seeing here tend to be those higher order bicycle crossings. But also, one thing I've taken away from cycling and, and walking in the Netherlands is that the engineering profession treats cyclists as a vehicle. They, all these tools are used for cars, so they just micro-size them for the ability of the design vehicle, the bicycle. And it works. Okay, another one, actually very similar to what we're just talking about here, similar concept except for except signals. We're actually talking about separate bike turn lanes. Now, we have a pretty well established stand in the United States. If you've got a right turn lane, the through bike lane continues through. I didn't think of putting any pictures of that, but you think you know what I'm talking about. It's actually the equivalent of this. But you notice that this was taken by Todd riding a bicycle holding a video camera, am I right? So uh, that, that shows you how good the pavement conditions are in Holland. No, that's digital jitter, not pavement jitter. Uh, so you see what we're talking about here. A right turn lane for bikes wanting to turn right, a through and left for bicyclists. Here's one that's a little bit more subtle. If you look beyond the tandem there, you see the bike lane coming through, and if you want to turn left, you kind of get a little bit of a bike box at that intersection. And by golly, of course, most of the examples in the U.S. just happen to be Portland, happen to have Roger as a model for them. Um, he hasn't asked me for royalties yet on this. <laughs> but this is an example where the Portland did it as part of the Bike Boulevard program, so it's not really analogous to what we just saw there, but we did, Todd and I did decide, let's try to finish up with the U.S. example if we can. So let's open it up. Separate bike turn lanes at intersections. I use them here in Portland, but frequently they're quite hair-raising because uh, the traffic will go by you maybe on both sides rather fast. Hmm. Well, I'd just like to point out that um, a general problem with facilities like this is the war for right-of-way we have in developed cities. Um, the example of the through lane and the right turn lane means that uh, somebody had to find that extra five feet or so in addition to the, the first bike lane. Portland, as I expect other cities, um, there's a, there's a real fight for that right-of-way, and of course parking usually trumps anything else. I sort of wonder uh, in Holland if they've made some accommodations in some places by removing or never installing parallel parking. No, there's plenty of on-street parking in Holland, but look at the width of those travel lanes. Anyone want to take a guess? Wait, they don't have Hummers. <laughs> okay, how wide are your travel lanes in downtown Portland? Anyone want to know? How long, right, 10 feet, and how wide are the turn lanes? Some of them are eight feet. You've got eight-foot turn lanes in downtown Portland. So it's interesting how to squeeze in extra travel lanes. Some cities are willing to accept very, very narrow lanes. But you're right. Are we willing to do that to add the infrastructure for bikes? Yeah. Well, then you wonder. I mean, there, obviously there has to be several alternatives. And even in a situation like this, then maybe it's a matter of sharing the pedestrian right-of-way with, you know, some of the bike operations. And I don't know if we're going to get into that later on. But, I mean, Not you're right. Not that, but you do raise a, a really issue. good point. And then maybe... I'll, yeah, if I can say that for the discussion at the end, but yeah, I'll, I'll be totally frank. A couple of things that I saw in um, my mother-in-law's hometown, Andrea's hometown, I'm really not that pleased about because they did take room away from the pedestrian. They narrowed up some sidewalks to create some treatments like this, and I feel that if you look at the green hierarchy, that's not where they should have taken it from. But yeah, they got to take it from somewhere, right? I think the one issue is you um, similar to the bike box as uh, the need for a critical mass of cyclists to be using it so that motorists know what it's about. There's one in just 
at 39th and I think Maine in southeast Portland and I just notice cars all the time occupying what's supposed to be a bicycle turn lane and uh, they just don't see enough cyclists in them to know that they're not supposed to be there. Uh, twice that issue came up. I think that's a really good one. You're going to create more right of way for bicyclists in the roadway. Make sure drivers see bicyclists off enough so they understand it. One more. Okay. One more. The gentleman next to Roger. Sorry. Um, one of the things is uh, bicyclists in Amer America in general don't, don't tend to take training. And so uh, we all talk about the, the automobile drivers not uh, respecting uh, the rules of, hey, that's a bike lane, stay in it. Uh, bicyclists don't follow the rules, so you might put in treatments like this, and bicyclists would just cut through the sidewalks and cut through parking lots and stuff like that. You want to address that? You have a good story to talk about training, right? Yeah. Oh. It's been a while since I was in grade school, but all children in Holland in fifth and sixth grade of uh, elementary school, which would be, I guess, middle school here, have to take a bicycle exam. They will plot a route through the town city and the teachers will be on certain points with a checkboard and uh, of course these things are discussed by parents at home a lot of parents ride with, ride with their kids to get them started and then it's reinforced in school and then there is the bicycle exam and I don't see any reason why that cannot be done as part of PE in the United States you know not through downtown Portland but like around the school area the residential area and uh, all teachers of the school make that kind of a traffic day. Instead of a sport day, it says traffic day. Yeah, I, I got one ticket for riding my bike when I was a kid in Geneva. And I want to guess what the offense was I was ticketed for. Something you'll never see happen here. I'll give you a hint. Popping wheelies. <laughs> <laughs> Going, too Going too slow. No, not having a light. That's the kind of stuff they enforce there, which is really critical. I'm sorry, talk about the comment, yeah. uh, getting back to one earlier comment. Um, the SUV car culture is arriving in, in, in Europe. I mean, over the 10 years I've been going there, you see more and more SUVs. So they're, they're getting pressure, too. And back to the parking question, you will see most urban residential areas have um, metered parking on street. So that kind of manages some of the, the parking pressure, too. You know, if you're willing to pay for it, you can use it. Yeah, well, it's really ironic when you look at the right of way. Overall, far less of an urban area is dedicated to transportation in Europe than here, so they inherently have less right of way to begin with. Now we're getting into a treatment that I think is really, really exciting. This first time I saw this about five or six years ago, it's becoming more and more common. The street in front of my dad's house in Switzerland, they did this too. They got a lot of very narrow rural roads. We only saw one or two examples in urban areas, mostly in urban sorry, rural-type roads connecting little villages that are really narrow, like 16 to 18 feet of pavement. They had a center line, and, you know, traffic would go one side of the center line and no room for bikes. So what they're doing is they're getting rid of the center lines and creating a single lane in the middle for bidirectional traffic with bikes on both sides. And we're talking about rural roads at speeds of, like, 35 to 50 miles an hour, two-way traffic. And when you drive a car, this is the rental car we had the time we went to rent a car in Holland, you go down the middle of the roadway, and when there's a car coming at you, you negotiate. And if there's a car coming at you at the same time as a bicyclist on each side, you slow down and you make room. And I think this is the most extreme example that Todd has up here. Uh, it's one of the few urban examples. And, you know, you mentioned the U.S. traffic engineer, they think you're from another planet. You've got to be kidding, right? And yet, it works remarkably well. If you're driving down a road knowing that traffic is coming at you at a closing speed of 80, 90 miles an hour, you're going to be driving that road very carefully, right? So are there exa – yeah, did you want to say something before we move on, Roger? Yeah. You know, what, what's the speed limit on that road right there? I think it's moot. It's slow. Yeah, you're not going to go very – but these others, I mean, these were – uh, the Dutch are going to have basic rules, so probably 55 miles an hour. There's no speed limits or anything on these roads. So their basic rule is about the same as ours, 90 kilometers in rural areas. I don't remember seeing any signs on these kind of roads. They connect the villages together. So are there any U.S. examples? This is a photo simulation that Todd did of a street in Albany that maybe could have it. And it actually is being proposed, and I think Al Albany City Council did approve this, so maybe we can get rid of that hokey simulation, Todd. No, sorry, very nice job. <laughs> actually, it's a very, very good job. And actually show you an example, yeah, right, of how it has been done. So when we ask you, are there any examples of such a thing in the U.S., before I show you the next slide, can people think of examples in the U.S.? We have two-way traffic facing each other down 
a lane not wide enough to accommodate two vehicles at a time. Dave? Well, this isn't a, an example that's exactly like this, but I was thinking about our bike boulevards that we have in Portland, and essentially you've got cyclists going both ways. It's narrow, traditional, neo-traditional street patterns, yeah, exactly. and there's not really enough room for two bikes, two cars, parking, and so there is a lot of negotiation that mm -hmm. goes on, and it seems to work if there are enough bicyclists there. Right. Here's an example with a painted, this, I mean, if you remove those, if you, you substitute those painted parking bays for the bike lanes we saw in Holland, it looks remarkably similar, right? So we have streets where we accept two-way traffic without room to pass each other, right? That's San Diego, right. Oh, these aren't, this is in Portland? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, any other comments, suggestions, ideas? Is uh, thanks. Yeah, one of the um, ideas that I've I've seen in Europe uh, is in, uh, taking the uh, planting strip, the little skinny space between the sidewalk and the street, and uh, kind of re-engineering uh, that area, the parking area in that area, to to shift cars over about three feet. And so even on a street like this, uh, shift, shift cars which way? Uh, onto that little planting strip. Okay. It maybe up. Uh, uh, Recreate the uh, surface with the permeable pavers or something, mm -hmm. um, but uh, you, I've seen I have pictures of it in lots right. of different communities where you have the sidewalk, the parking space, and in between the parking space are the trees. So the the planting strip and the parking strip are all one large area. But and that's uh, in this that's, area, right. in this area, if if the cars were shifted over into the planting strip, you could have both on street parking and bike lane and a narrow driveway. That's an interesting observation because that's actually fairly traditional. When we think of providing more space, we move to the outside. What we're talking about here is not touching the outside at all and moving vehicles towards the inside more, moving them away from the side of the road. So, yeah, that is an approach that we, that we do in this country, and this is what we're talking about is the opposite approach, just move traffic further from the side of the road more towards the middle. So, yeah, it is a different perspective, absolutely. Anyone else? Um, Okay, Rich, the gentleman in back, and then Jeff, then Todd, yeah. I think the similar examples you've shown us, Michael, in the U.S., are, they look like they're primarily um, a sort of suburban or inner city examples with parking. And uh, I'm thinking of forest service roads as an example of single-lane roads, hundreds, thousands of miles uh, that function okay uh, with even occasional bike traffic. But there must be a difference between... Uh, how the U.S. approaches this and how Europeans approach it, because I think uh, there's there's a lot of speeding on far service roads. I see it as a, a concept that could work in urban areas where cars are going slow anyway. A uh, concern I'd have would be an example you had earlier was, a, I think, a rural lane mm -hmm. in, in Holland or something. And uh, at least when I was in Europe, it seemed like a lot of rural lanes there um, require drivers to be just on guard for stray sheep and all sorts of things. <laughs> and uh, I think American motor culture, uh, there isn't an expectation that you will have obstruction. So people aren't on guard for that sort of thing. Good point. Um, yeah. Good point. Jeff? Uh, in terms of making that sort of design work here, I think you probably need to change state law that would allow drivers to pull into a bike lane or get two drivers passing. So. Good comment, Jeff. I would like to see state law change that on a road without a center line, you are not obligated to ride on the right half. I think, frankly, it's safer to ride down the middle of a road than on the right half of a road. Uh, Philadelphia, a friend of mine, the traffic engineer of the city of Philadelphia, they had a city councilor who absolutely insisted that they start painting center lines on local streets. It was absolutely horrible, the effect that it had. People drove faster. Bicyclists and pedestrians felt threatened. And a few years later, they had to go out and take out hundreds of miles of yellow center lines. So, right, the vehicle code right now says drive on the right half of the road. And... I think that should be questioned. One more than Todd, then move on. Okay. I'll get you again. <clears throat> Thanks. I think contrary to the previous suggestion, I think this might actually work better in a suburban area than in a, in a city. My argument goes like this. In the city area, in Portland, the streets are heavily used for parking. And I was trying to imagine this being applied to a street like 34th <coughs> Avenue where I live or, or some street like that, which is already pretty narrow to begin with. And you'd be, you'd get amazing opposition, for, I mean immense opposition from people who live on that street, who don't have a garage to park their car, who don't want to walk half a block to use their car. On the other hand, for suburban areas, for newer developed areas, 
where every house has a garage, possibly even a two or two car, three car garage, where the streets aren't being used for parking, you might have a better way of because you're not really displacing any parking by doing it. Good point. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. My comments about the rural application of this as well, and I don't, I'm not all that familiar with. Um, rural Oregon roads, but I'm thinking in, in Maine where the rural roads are very narrow and they're pretty good for cycling and if you were to go in and um, paint stripes and to create, because in your, your graphic you showed um, yeah, pretty back. skinny bike lanes. Back. Back. <laughs> it was the first one. Because, no, back further. <laughs> no, one more. One more. <laughs> That one is um, the pavement tends to be really crumbly on the edge, and I, I could imagine a situation. At least, I mean, a lot of the state DOTs are really poor, and so they've been deferring maintenance on these roads, anyways. So you might end up creating a situation that's a little less safe for cyclists than what they have now, which is just to ride on the roads. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if the outside edge is right, and that's a good, good recommendation, I think, for any practice, don't give bicyclists any impression there's an area for you unless the pavement is really up to it. Yeah, good point. But, but I think one thing we have going for us in, in the states, you know, our drivers do behave like this, but only in, say, parking lots. You know, generally there's that give and take mentality. And um, I, I would like to see that, this, this uh, type of striping used on um, in city, uh, on streets where you don't have, you need parking, but you just move, peop you just move the, the cars over, I guess, into the shared lane so you can keep on street parking. So it's not always the bike lane versus parking. You don't want that kind of conflict. And also another nice thing is you're not moving the parking, the car, the parked cars around, so you still have at least the 20 feet clear zone for fire to get access. You know, you've got the, maybe the 14 foot or 16 foot car lane shared, and you've got the two, four to five foot bike lanes on the side. So you still have that, that clear space that fire is always pushing for. All right, next one, and this is something that is very, very common in Europe, and I have spoken to a few of the transit providers about this. In around the late 70s, early 80s, when they started providing bus-only lanes, they realized very quickly that bicyclists were starting to use them, and they tried to ban them from there. And I can tell you as a cyclist that there's a lot of congestion, and there's a wide-open transit lane, uh, you know where you're going to gravitate towards, right? And a lot of streets, it's just a simple matter of sharing. This is a pedestrian transit mall that no vehicles are allowed, and they tried to ban bikes, and it was absolutely hopeless. And, of course, we have a very well-known example right here in Portland of where uh, we are sharing the lane with transit and the tracks and all that. And it was very, very controversial. I know a lot of people in the bicycle community in Portland were very, very concerned about this. And it's been on the ground for about a year now, I would say, right? More, year More than a year and a half, the trams, yeah. So can we share lanes with transit, whether it be buses or fixed track rails? Not to. Yet one more reason not to invest in rail and choose <laughs> rubber-tired buses. Well, we don't have any opinions here, do we? <laughs> I, I think we can, and even, even on streetcar streets, we could if we had the same kind of speed limits and motorist behavior that we have, that you have in the Netherlands. Uh, if the uh, speed was... 30 kilometers an hour, which is 18, and if motorists were willing to be patient to wait behind cyclists so that they can execute that slow speed turn across the tracks, um, and cyclists knew that motorists would be patient enough. I think the thing that makes this kind of maneuver difficult for a lot of cyclists is the high volumes of relatively high speed traffic with motorists who really don't care to be patient to wait for a cyclist to slow down to five miles an hour to execute a slow turn. So it's the motorist rather than the transit operator that makes you nervous. That's, that's interesting. It's, right? it's, it's, you know, executing that kind of turn is very simple if you can do it at a, at a speed at which you feel comfortable that you're not going to slip out on the tracks. I see. It's so the it's pressure. The riding, it's the changing in and out of it is what you're trying. Okay, interesting point. Can we get someone here? No? Okay, Jeff, go ahead. My question is, do streetcar tracks work in Holland? I mean, do they, do they place the streetcars in the center of the street, or do they have <coughs> essentially the same situation that we have here in Portland, where they're well, essentially they're in, the, in the travel lane? I think wherever they need to go. I mean, just thinking back, some are more in the center, some are in the side. Uh, some of the shots I showed you in Geneva, or they just took up a whole travel lane. So I think they put them where they can or where they need to, depending on the type of street. 
and they haven't taken any measures. Uh, it's different than what we've done here to make them bike compatible. I was, I was uh, for today's session. I was kind of breezing through the Crow Manual from the Netherlands, and they do, um, they do make concessions. They do, they um, require a different track gauge, the the, the gap, based on um, expected cycle routes. They will make it a little wider so that your tire does not get totally wedged into the gap. But they do, they do realize this conflict, and they try to, they try to minimize it. Typically, they, if they know there will be a lot of cyclists through this type of route, they do provide, try to provide the, the area or minimize the speed differential. Oh, well, to me, there's a difference between this, the, sh the shared traffic way, and then our bus mall, where it's just for sections, just bus. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, as a bicyclist, I sometimes bike <laughs> on that anyway. But, but, um, but I think there needs to be, if that's going to be a standardized thing, there needs to be some sort of understanding between buses and bikes what you know if there's a dedicated way like that what they'll be using and uh, and I don't know if that happens in Holland if there's a bus ways or dedicated bus malls or things like that. I don't know about Holland I do know that Seattle created some bu exclusive bus lanes and uh, Seattle was very fortunate the head of the local bicycle advocacy group was a bus driver for the Seattle out of the Seattle King County Transit is, and they did educate the bus drivers quite a bit on the fact that they would be sharing the lanes with bikes. The same happened in Eugene, too, when LTD opened up their first exclusive bus lanes, and bicyclists just flocked to them, and they, they did put the burden on the transit operators because you know who they are. You can capture them in a class like this. There's maybe 80 bus drivers. You know, in Eugene, you get all 80 in a classroom and educate them about, you know, operating around bicyclists. Well, but they're like for a bus mall, like the, it seems to me the purpose of the bus mall is so the buses can move through. I mean, I don't use it regularly as a cyclist, but so buses can move through to good tack, you know, to kind of keep on schedule and whatnot. So I don't know if buses should really be made to accommodate, accommodate cyclists formally or if it just has to be an informal agreement. But. Well, from what I know in Switzerland, at least, it was an informal agreement. I went to a conference and they talked about that. It was an informal agreement. Though they did start, you saw the bike lane stencils that they signed to put in those bus lanes. It's, mm -hmm. If you can't lick them, join them type of philosophy, I think. Okay. And one more, yeah. One place here in Portland where this doesn't work well for bikes at all is going down Lovejoy, where you have two way traffic, and on the right side you have curb extensions so that you can't go between the curb extension and the railroad tracks. So uh, I and a lot of other cyclists ride more or less down the center of the road, and we have uh, traffic passing the opposite way going very fast. Rather than riding in the middle of the tracks? Uh, in the middle of the tracks, there's an interchange near um, when you pass underneath uh, the highway, and it's just a confusion of tracks, and it's <coughs> worse to be there. Hmm. Okay. All right, great. Um, I hope you don't mind us rushing through like this, but there's a lot of subjects we want to cover. And, Robert, let's make it a two-hour next time we do something like this, okay? Uh, the last of the bike treatments we're going to be looking at is something interesting. We are getting used to contraflow bike lanes. This is quite different. It's a one-way street for motor vehicle traffic in which bicyclists are allowed to go against the traffic through signing only. And how many of you subscribe to the ABBP listserv? A couple of you see Kara Seidman just yesterday asked are there any examples of this in the United States. And I'd like to see if she knows of any example, if any people will respond to her with that. She's from uh, Cambridge. So like I said, it's a one-way street for motor vehicles, but bikes can go in both directions. And people ask, what does a bicyclist in this direction do? Bicycles in that direction rides with traffic. Here's an example of one in Switzerland where it's that situation, but just at the very end, did they paint a little bit of a bike lane to indicate to drivers entering the street that you know, expect bicyclists coming at your right there. The rest of the street is not wide enough for a bike lane, obviously. And here's some of the signs that they use, like for example, um, you know, one way for cars, but two way bikes. Uh, if you're cat macaron cookies with you, you can go down the street is what that means. No, those are little parking emblems that people use. So they are simply signed. And so the question is to you, could we or should we start allowing bicyclists to ride against traffic on one-way streets? read in the San Francisco Bicycle Coalition's uh, newsletter, they did an extensive article on this. They're putting in a bunch in San Francisco, and they used the argument that if you find cyclists riding the wrong way already on one-way streets, that that's a failure of the system to accommodate um, non-car traffic, and it requires cyclists to go too far out of their way, so that's a symptom that needs fixing through this, was their argument. 
That's a really good point. You got straight to the chase on that one. I was wondering, because I think all the other times that we've come up with this one, no one ever mentioned that, right? Why they're riding against traffic in the first place, right? That's a really good point, that the one-way street system was not designed with bicyclist mobility in mind. Very good. Uh, good. I remember reading a study from Utah that said that if you're riding the wrong way and on a sidewalk, you increase your chances of getting hit by a car by like 380%. Um, on a sidewalk, and, right. Yeah, on the, and on the road about but, twice. But I think yeah. that going the wrong way on a one-way off the sidewalk might have similar challenges where people aren't accustomed to looking mm -hmm. right. the wrong way before they right. turn. Um, and I, I think that that's, that's the major challenge. Right. Maybe it's a signage issue or something like that. Uh, the studies that I've seen is you increase your chance of a crash by riding against traffic on the road by about twofold and on the sidewalk about four or five-fold, you're right. But don't forget, we're not talking about, we're talking about a one-way street. So just like when you put a contraflow bike lane, you're still expected to be on the right side of traffic. But you're right, a, a motorist entering that street may not think of looking both ways. Not, a lot of that is addressed by signing, right? So yeah, that is definitely a concern, absolutely. Yeah, Roger. One of the big problems <clears throat> in the U.S. is concerns about liability. That it would be because you can sue the city, you can sue the jurisdiction, you can sue the traffic engineer that would allow for essentially wrong way riding on a one-way street, traffic engineers are reluctant to do it. The way that we've addressed it in Portland, around a number of our schools, we've created one-way traffic flows with signed do not enter one way and uh, recognizing full well that cyclists are going to ride two ways on the streets and we just wink at it, but we can't design it. Well, the sign wouldn't be enough, though, Toledo. If you do an engineering study and you take into account some of the comments that we heard, and then you figure we can do. You don't think? Um, I, you know, I think it, I think it can work, and um, and I think the traffic. You know, some of the traffic engineers recognize that it will work fine. But the first time somebody gets hit, that opens up the city to uh, a large liability suit. Okay. Let's take two more, and then move on. Um, how about two we haven't heard from? Then they'd be in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 This is slightly ten tangential, but you had mentioned bike lanes always being on the right side. And um, when, particularly with transit, that can create a conflict and tension between the bike lanes and transit pulling over for stops. And so I find myself liking to travel on the other side. And I'm wondering if you've seen examples where they actually put the, the bike lane on the other side or yeah, one -way how street? common that has been. Yeah, a one-way street. And so uh, then it's not uncommon. I know that in Manhattan they've been on the left side of all their one-way streets for like 20 years. And about three years ago I got an email from the Manhattan bike pet coordinator asking me, what do you think of bike lanes on the right? So there it's just very common <laughs> to put them on the left and right. But in this situation here, if you're riding against traffic on a one-way street, I've never seen a bicyclist do anything different from... This. They will be on the right. You're not talking about the types of streets with heavy transit and things sure. like that in this situation. I think. Sure. Yeah. Sure. But I think the expectation would be that you would be on the right. Against, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh really? Okay. The bikes don't pick. Okay. Thanks for letting us know that. Okay, you heard that? Yeah, I wish we'd heard that sooner. Just a comment. There are people who might want to watch this later next year. All this stays online. So we're not yeah. trying to annoy you. We're trying to make this a resource right. that will be useful in the future as well as for us here today. So we appreciate your... You need a bigger room, Robert. <laughs> uh, also, I don't know if Michael mentioned this, but typically these these facilities are typically short links. And there's also access. So to your question, right. too. Right. And also, you know, typically very few driveways, you know, access control. That goes to your, I think that goes to the point that you made, too. If it was for one or two miles, then you realize there's something wrong with the system. But most of these are very short links. Great. Um, we're exact, well, it's okay, exactly on time to move on to the next one. Yeah, okay. Um, let's move on to the next subject area. We're going to be looking at some pedestrian treatments now. And uh, yes, there is a reason why I chose this slide. It's not to show that they're always out there trying to put things in pedestrians' way. Uh, this, it's actually remarkable. Every, this is the town of Lissingen. That's Andrea. This is where my mother-in-law lives. And every time we go, they're redoing the streets. They're never satisfied, you know. But one thing that's remarkable is every time we go, the changes are always in the direction of constraining traffic. I mean, I don't know if they've ever done a street widening project in the last 20 years in Vrissingen. I don't remember seeing any, right? So every time they make a change to the street, it is to change it 
in the direction of more room for cyclists, more room for pedestrians. And they do use a lot of pavers there. That's another reason why I took this, a lot of sandy soils. It does make it easier to change things around. If you didn't get it quite right, take out the pavers and do it again. So did, did you have a comment before we move on? Yeah. I just wanted to uh, say if anybody's having a tr uh, trouble f accommodating uh, traffic, bicycles, parking, and pedestrians, uh, there's an example where they move the uh, p parking over and use the uh, planting strip and the parking strip yeah. all as one uh, thank right there at the car. I've got a whole presentation on just that concept alone, the idea of parking bays instead of a literal on-street parking, and Todd sent me some really good slides. Good point. So here's one that we're going to look at, and this was the, uh, the thought I asked you to hold earlier. And unfortunately, I realized after I took these photos, I did not do a good enough job of taking pictures of the whole situation. This is a pedestrian push button mid-block to get a pedestrian signal. What you don't see when I forgot to take a picture of is there is, an, oh, there is a traffic signal stopping traffic. If you push the button, you will get a traffic signal, green, yellow, red, that stops traffic, and then you cross. What's very different about the system they have here is instead of just staying, reverting back to don't walk, so when you go up there, you have a don't walk, and then you push the button and you wait for a walk signal, it's a flashing yield. And the implication is that if you want to cross the street on your own, you can do it, you have to yield to traffic. If you're not getting a gap in traffic, you push a button and traffic stops. This is a different intersection, but it's a similar situation. This person pushed the button, this one happens to be at an intersection, stop the traffic. Like I said, Andrea, next time you go back, take a camera, okay? So we can get the whole picture here. So like I said, I'm sorry I did not do a good job explaining it, I mean showing it in illustration, but again, the idea is that a lot of intersections and a lot of mid-block crossings, it just rests on yield. So if you want to cross on your own, you may. You have to yield to traffic. If you're not getting a break, you push the button and you stop traffic. One observation I can tell you that we made casually is most adults did not bother pushing the button. Young kids and older people, people with disabilities, usually did push the button. They wanted that security. The other thing that happens is it's a very hot response. You push that button, like someone mentioned here earlier, immediately you get the yellow on the side and then the red and then you get the full walk. So this is a concept that we would definitely have to change the vehicle code to right now because our signals just simply don't allow this. this is the walk, the flashing don't walk, and then the full don't walk. That's all that we have available to us. Uh, three questions for you. When was it introduced? Don't know. Were there, were there problems with people understanding it when it was introduced? And what, what is the yield? Uh, on, on one of the slides, it looked like it had the standard white person indicating the walk mm -hmm. yeah, right there. Right. And I assume that it's a red person or a red hand indicating the don't walk. No, no, this reverts back to that flashing yield. Now, this is okay, one of so the, this so one. It's, so it's either a flashing yield right. or a walk. Most signals are conventional. Don't get me wrong. Most are conventional. Walk, don't walk. Okay, with an intermediate stage of flashing, right. This one is walk or yield. Right, it does not have a don't walk. It's either walk or yield. Right, those are the two choices. As far as how far back it goes, I know it's the first one in Honigun in 1995. And I think the problem that they're trying to solve with this is if you have a PED signal and everyone pushes it all the time, it will be a disruption to traffic. And my guess is a lot of these enhanced pedestrian treatment, crossing treatments that we're doing are really in response to capacity. How can we get pedestrians across the street without reducing capacity? And if people observe pedestrians just dashing across the street anyhow, this is just a way of enabling them to do it legally. Yeah. Um, I, I would think this would work great going across NATO to get down to Tom McCall Waterfront Park. I know that I do it right now anyway, cross against traffic. If there's a gap, I... Ever in your life crossed against traffic? <laughs> Anyone not raising their hand is... <laughs> so, I mean, the mentality is already there that I've witnessed, and I do it myself, so I think this would be something that could be incorporated down there. Right, and, okay, good point, yeah. Again, I don't know this answer or anything, but... I don't, don't know how much of a liability issue it would be here, again, because I think we tend to be a little more litigious than our European friends. Yep. So would there be a liability? Probably, yeah. What I, with what I notice with pedestrian behavior is they tend to push it no matter what. You know, I mean, there's no, there's no disadvantage not to push it. So in, in this situation, why would someone not push it? Good question. And remember, Andrea, we noticed people, yeah, if... I mean, when we approach it, we look left, look right, no traffic, we go for it. And I stood here and observed quite a few, like I said, adults, I'd say 15 to 65, who looked fairly able-bodied and alert. Most of them did not push it. 
They just saw the, the fact there's no traffic. And I think it's kind of an understanding, why should I screw up traffic if I don't have to? And that's just my guess, but we did not observe that. That's a very valid point, but we just simply didn't observe it by watching pedestrians. Yeah. So then the, um, say, the average daily traffic on the roads where these are, are used is fairly low? I'm just No, fairly high. High enough to warrant a pedestrian-only signal. If it was fairly low, you wouldn't have a signal. No, there's quite a bit of traffic on this road, yeah. Because it would be disruptive if you did something like that on the, on the park blocks, I would think. I don't know, it's not a question, I hope, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, those are good observations, I mean, but... You got a, little bit, a little bit further up, there is an intersection with uh, traffic lights for both... I don't know how you say it. Yeah. There's yeah, an official right. intersection. Right. It's not There's just somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Right. right. Yes. There will be a break in traffic anyway. Right. I think San Francisco has installed something like this on Market Street. I saw something at the uh, Powell... Um, um, turntable for the the trolley. So, but I'm not. I haven't really checked into it. I'm, I'm going to try to see. Okay, take one more and then move on. Uh, well, it's the same too. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, Roger. <laughs> the example that I saw of exactly this in in England, it was a very fast signal. So you're not right. stopping the the street traffic for very long right. when you do push the button. Good, good point. Okay, here's one that I find very exciting. It's a roadway design one. I've showed this quite a bit, and this is one that a lot of people are looking at and sure why not. Couldn't we do this? Uh, this is a fairly major street. You've seen a few pictures of it already, and this is a local street that ties into it. And the so-called so rules of access management tell you that in, sheer, in theory, you don't want local streets coming into arterials. And of course, residents who live on the local streets don't like that at all. So what they do when a local street comes into a main street, they design it a lot more like a driveway connection. The sidewalk stays completely level all the way across, and the cars have to go up and down. So in essence, you're creating something like a speed hump, if you will. There's a car going very, very slowly over it. Of course, this is always going to be stop or yield controlled on the side street and bicyclists get through there too. It's, it's fairly abrupt, but not too bad on a bicycle. The advantages are it enables you to keep those local streets open to circulation so people live on the street, who have visitors coming, emergency vehicles, deliveries, etc. But it reduces what a lot of people fear, which is cut-throughs and people using it as shortcuts or inappropriate manners. So, could this be done in the United States? Could we start designing intersections with local streets to look more like a driveway than a full street intersection? Certainly can be done and is being done. The problem I would have on busy streets, you mentioned the arterial, is the left turn from the arterial and, and a risk of, of them making going through the gap and having to slow through there. So one of the advantages of having an at-grade intersection is they could make that left Relatively that's an interesting observation because that's what the DOT will tell you. And we, when we develop driveway standards, uh, the cities were telling us we want cars to cross the sidewalk slowly, and the DOT was saying no, we want them to get out of there really fast. So again, it's a question of, of values, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, you have to stay in traffic longer. You have to make that turn. I think you saw that right-turning vehicle. You could obviously see it was very slow. Good point. Yeah. There's another issue, and a lot of communities use at-grade intersections to denote the intersection of a public road with a public road and driveways to denote where you are leaving the public right away going onto a private road or a, a parking lot or a driveway sort of situation. And so your laws change as you go from the public right away off of the public right away and you'd have to find some way to denote that you are still on the public right away so the laws still apply. That's a really good observation because I can think of the reverse example, and that is there's a lot of pressure from developers when they have a big development. They want to create something that looks like an intersection, whereas in reality it's a driveway. And we, working for the DOT, say, no, you've got to make it look more like a driveway. And you're talking about just the reverse here. So the same legal questions arise. That's a good point. I never thought of that. Yeah. And I lived in Eugene a few years ago by something similar to this, and it seems to me that you can't just plop these in. You have to design them as a system throughout the street or a specific corridor because mm -hmm. traffic will still cut through if there's only one or two that they know they have to navigate through. And it seems to me like you've decreased the safety in these intersections because of the grade separations, it's difficult for the drivers to see the, over the sidewalk and see the cars coming from the other direction. So okay. just one concern I have. It. Okay. I think one of the better reasons for doing this is environmental because like 
now that it's raining in Oregon, the, when you're a pedestrian, they always have the grates, and so the intersections will be these big puddles, and if, when you have a ramp or this treatment, then you can walk and not... You're talking about the human them. environment. Yeah, the right, human not worry about the fishies. Right. Yeah. Everybody else doesn't matter. <laughs> it keeps a, a nice thing. Right. Well, in answer to your questions, uh, Todd did send me this photo. You said there's some in Eugene. This is in Vancouver, right? You, you sent me this yeah, photo. Yeah, this is uh, Vancouver. Right. Now, in answer to the question this gentleman had, the observation, is it just one isolated one, or is it up and down this street? Uh, this is uh, along Columbia Boulevard, basically for about uh, three to four blocks. Um, the city uh, went in and did this overtly to kind of define this pedestrian shared use path leading from the waterfront up to our uh, Central Park, Esther Short Park. And um, it's on both sides of the street. Off to our right, you would see it. Um, it works very well. and. I haven't heard any complaints. Uh, John, have you heard any complaints about its operation? I mean... So it was done as part of a system, like this. Yes. Out. Okay, Though fine. we are struggling to continue it to the north. And did the legal issues ever come up as far as... Uh, I wasn't he here at that time. Uh, John, do you remember anything? No. Okay. Okay, next one. We're not going to spend any time on the classic Vorner. I think that's something that people understand pretty well, and that's in a residential area. You have a street where pedestrians and traffic share the street. What we're talking about is a shared street, pedestrians, cars, in a commercial district, and the uh, Dutch term they use is Winkel F. That means like a more a commercial area. These are streets that are open to motor vehicle traffic, but there is real no curb. Sometimes there's a bit of a delineation. In other places, it's very intense traffic calming to really get traffic speeds down. And the reasons these are looked at is you have some areas where the streets are extremely narrow. And if you wanted to have decent sidewalks, say 8 to 10 feet on both sides and on street parking, and even just a single lane for traffic, you've already used up more than all your right away. So the idea is instead of trying to delineate areas for each one of those uses, we mix it all together and we traffic coming to the point where pedestrians and motorists will feel comfortable. And we did find a U.S. example right here in Oregon. There's several, as a matter of fact. Nye Beach did this. We talked to them about two years about it. And they took the risk, and it's been out there for about a year, I would say, and it seems to be working remarkably well. I took a series of 30 slides watching interactions between drivers and cars back and forth, back and forth. And the people walk down the street, and people drive about five, six miles an hour, and you look over your shoulder, and you realize, okay, someone wants to go through here. You move over, you let them through, and that's the way that it's supposed to operate. So Where is it, again, Michael? What town is this? N uh, Newport. Sorry, Night Beach is in Newport. Right, yeah. It's, that's the uh, ocean in the background there. So, I mean, obviously we are doing it here. We can do it here. I, I, what I'm really curious to hear about is what kind of legal issues is this raised. The gentleman who brought them up earlier has left, but do we, how do we feel about doing something like this, just letting cars and pedestrians mix it up on a f relatively busy street? We're not talking about a residential street. We're talking about streets with traffic and quite a bit of use. We love it. We move on. Next one. Is that it? Okay, great. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm assuming that's a good sign. <laughs> Go ahead and then... Yeah. I'm not an expert about legal things, but when I talk to people about Wunerf type arrangements, I always, I'm always told that ADA doesn't allow it, that if you're going to provide pedestrian facilities, they have to be grade separated from, from traffic. And, th and that is true, and that's something that I'd like us to overcome. I'd, I'd hate to see ADA dictate urban design. It should be the other way around. We should be designing good streets and then make sure they accommodate people with disabilities. That's a good, very good point. I wasn't going to speak to the, leg uh, the legality, but I'm wondering if the merchants might like this, because the more they slow down traffic, the more likely they're going to see through the window and want to shop. Yeah, so. plus you don't lose the on-street parking, too, and everyone is automatically a window shopper. Yeah, yeah, I, that would be my guess, that merchants would really like this, yeah. Uh, about the ADA issue, the photo you're showing us up here, Michael, it looks like there's a rolled curb and there is a little grade separation yeah. there uh, next to the store. So it seems like, in theory, with a rolled curb, it could work for a grade separation. But uh, I think, you know, this is just, like, fabulous. I mean, we should be doing a lot more of this. It gets at the issue of the war for the right-of-way, and it taps into something the engineers know as the diversity factor, which is things are not going to use the same area all the time, 100 percent of the time, so that, you know, we can share. Um, that's kind of a tough concept in America, I think, sharing. Everybody wants their own. 
Uh, there's a proposal to do this on one of the streets in the Pearl District, and I came up and showed them some slides like this about three or four years ago, and it, it didn't get it didn't get anywhere. But I'd like to think that maybe it could be revived. Yeah, the person in pink, then Roger. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that many business districts in the United States are uh, also through streets, through traffic streets. So it probably be a consideration is uh, what's the is it a destination so then people get there and go slowly through it or are they just trying to get to the other side and then it becomes a, a, a obstruction right yeah I, I don't think you'd see anything like this on a thoroughfare you would not see this on the main street through town this would be like the little side streets tying into it this is not the main street in Night Beach by any means right good point yeah Roger well we we do have this um, on a street in the Pearl on Northwest 13th Avenue where That's it right. is designed to That's be right. shared okay. by everybody and um, in terms of whether this can work, I think it does. The, I remember being shocked to hear some traffic engineers talk about a facility being so dangerous that it was safe. Yep. And, and you, know what? Um, <coughs> you know, if you put pedestrians out on the street, motorists will respond appropriately and slow down. And that's something we know from rural roads, too. I mean, you used to look at some of the highways in central Oregon with no guardrail and a 2,000-foot drop to a chasm below. No one falls off those roads. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, let's move on to the next one. Actually, there is, a, there is a new example in the region. Um, uh, Clark County up in Vancouver just built a, a Vundner Flag Street in front of their um, new office building on um, West 13th Street. So come up and take a look. Great. Just finish right at 1.30 because I think we're going to go uh, three or four minutes over to do two more. Is that okay, Robert? Okay, great. The next one is pedestrian malls. There's nothing new about pedestrian malls, but what is really interesting if you go to Europe is most towns that have pedestrian malls, the pedestrian malls are expanding. They're getting bigger and bigger. There's actually merchants at the end of the malls saying to city council, when are you going to turn my block into a pedestrian mall? And they're shrinking and disappearing in the United States. I've actually got some pictures, I don't know if I put them up here, of the destruction of their pedestrian mall in Eugene. And so... Let's just ask, you know, examples from, here it is. This is the day before it got taken out. You can see all the cut marks. The bulldozers are getting ready to come in. So I just went through those pretty fast. I don't think the concept of a pedestrian mall is alien to anyone here. There are a few successful U.S. examples. The one in Boulder, Colorado is extremely successful. There's one in Santa Monica. There are a few others. Notice the little subtle hint right here. And so how come there are about two or three pedestrian malls in the United States that seem to be working? Most of them have not worked. They're being reverted back to traffic. What are the differences that make them successful in Europe and not here? It's all about density. You need to have a variety of, of uses in the area. You need to have residents that kind of are the eyes and ears on the street. Um, again, I live by the one in Eugene. It was a very unsafe area because you had all forms of traffic restricted, not just automobiles, but bicycles, roller skates, roller blades, skateboards, you name it. So it was a street that was to be avoided by any traffic going more than a block or two. Um, the other thing, too, is the car culture in America. It is so ingrained that um, you know retail is just not willing to locate unless you have a university or a hospital, something where there's just a real large number of employees within a small area. Yeah, I, think, I think you hit some of the key issues right on, yeah. Exactly. I mean, some of the good examples is Burlington, Vermont. I mean, typically where you have a pedestrian mall associated with a university where you have a, a pretty dense population, a lot of foot traffic, they're successful. But otherwise, you know, it's pretty difficult, especially in a medium-sized or smaller town. I mean, it's it could be the death unless it's a destination, purely a destination. Do one more, and then I'll, I have a proposal for you to entertain. Go ahead, Robert. The comment that Charlottesville, Virginia, has one that's sort of coming back, and it's not right next to the university. Hmm. Coming but back, so it, yeah, they didn't it, undo it. They just no, they didn't undo it. It sort of right. went through a decline, but they right. recently built an ice skating rink right, right next to it. So it's <laughs> one 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 question because we did have an email question that's more general, but I thought maybe at the end you could just respond to the the question that was asking. Um, you know, we perceive everything in Holland for bicyclists as being. Uh, sort of nirvana, but are there things that the Dutch think could be better? So I think that would be something maybe you could oh, type yes. at the end. Yeah, and, okay, thanks. And I hope we didn't, we definitely didn't want to give the impression that everything to do for bicycles and pedestrians in Holland is perfect and works great. We just want to pick of this, what, probably 30 treatments that we're not looking at, Todd, the ones that we discussed, right? One more controversial. Here's one thing I like to propose to you for pedestrian malls, and this is just based on my own observations and talking to merchants and things like that. And watching streets evolve into pedestrian malls in the United States and Europe over the last 30 years, all the pedestrian malls that I've seen that are successful in Europe are streets that were so incredibly successful, so clogged with traffic, the traffic became an impediment to commerce. Everyone wanted to be on that street. There was businesses, there was pedestrians, there's deliveries, traffic, 
what have you. And to make the street really function as it should for commerce, get rid of the traffic. And I think in the United States, we did just the opposite. We took towns that were failing, and we said, let's see if we can make it successful by getting rid of traffic. And I think you have to have an area, I think that, and that was hinted at by both of your comments, you have to have an area that's inherently successful to begin with. I don't think you can turn around a dead downtown by getting rid of traffic. This, I don't think there's ever been an example of that. Just have one comment. I read an interesting article about changing shopping behavior in the past five years. And the Americans used to go to shopping malls and spend a lot of time walking around. And I think, um, or yeah, I think it changed. People want to drive up to the place where they do their shopping, they want to drive away. And I think pedestrian malls is, is like a shopping mall, which is kind of kind of thing. Maybe it's outside, you can argue it's nicer. Shopping behavior has changed. People want to drive up to where they want to buy their stuff. Get the big box. And I think that ties in very well the comment I just made because there's other reasons why places are successful. It's not just for shopping. You have to have other attractors down there too. Other reasons why you'd want to be in that area, whether it be employment, like some people mentioned, entertainment, parks. You mentioned the skating rink. Exactly. Well, you're saying okay. it's the diversity of right. the downtowns that the malls don't have, which is why people are shopping right. more in downtown. Yeah, the pedestrian mall is only for shopping. It's only going to attract shoppers, and you're right. Okay, uh, I'm going to run through these really, really quickly because I got a set of new ones I really want to share with you. I'm really quite excited about. Don't even think that we're going to spend time talking about these in individual ways. These are just some examples of how extremely seriously they do take traffic calming as far as trying to slow traffic down, coming into villages, in towns. So like I said, this is actual physical restrictions with bollards that go up and down. Some of these treatments, like, you know, things that really do stick up on the side of the roadway, right? So there's no way we have time to go all of these through all these individually. This is a bollard that the residents of the street can touch. Some of them are actually, like, with the infrared remote controls or whatever, keyed, they go down. So there are a lot of pretty extreme traffic measures out there that are physical in nature. So I did want to jump straight to this one. Sorry, Todd, about all the others, because it's one that I'm pretty excited about, and that I'd like to get your reaction to it, okay? This is a traffic signal at an intersection coming up. There's the traffic signal. There's the warning. 150 meters, there's a light. We do that too, right? We warn people there's a traffic signal coming up sometimes. And look what it says. If you're going above 50 kilometers an hour, which is the posted speed, that's what you get. You go at 50 kilometers an hour or less, you get a green light. So what it does, it rewards people who do the speed limit. <laughs> you get through. And if you're going too fast, sorry, buddy, it'll trigger. Now, people ask me, what if you run the light? This is also a photo radar, so it does both. It checks the speed and gives you a ticket for running the red light. So here it is under normal condition. It rests on green. What's really in is also a bus stop there. Yeah, thanks, Todd. It's also it's called a half signal. I know you have examples of half signals in Portland. The side street is just stop controlled. So it is at an intersection. The side street is stop controlled. So there it is on green. Traffic is going through. No, proceeding normally at the speed limit. It also has a pedestrian push button. So if a pedestrian needs to cross the street or a bicyclist, they can push the button. This car, of course, took advantage of the fact that traffic was stopped and slipped out. But that's okay. You know, he stopped. And here's the one uh, pulling out, even though it also, while it's still red. Now, here are some cars that got caught. This is long after. These cars were just barreling through at above the speed limit, and the light turned red on them. The only downside that I see is if this guy was doing the speed limit, he has to stop too. So, this is very, very creative, I think. It's extremely effective, except for the fact that you need to put in a signal, but maybe they're able to meet the signal warrants. And by the way, I've only seen these at intersections. I can't imagine just in the middle of a block putting one of these up. Could we have traffic signals that are also used to regulate traffic speeds? my memory is correct, um, Herndon, Virginia put in something like this in the early 80s, except it was sensors in the road. Because um, if we, sp I grew up there, and if we, Herndon, ne near Reston, outside Washington, D.C., and if we would speed through Herndon, we'd get a stoplight. Because uh, we that. got stoplights all the time. Someone said in Virginia, I didn't get the name of the town. And is it still there, do you know? As far as I know. Okay, so there's one in the ass that we know of. I was going to say that it, it sounds like a great treatment for on the edge of uh, small towns when going from a highway into a street or from a, a, a 
major road as you enter, like, say, more of a business district section, mm -hmm. at the first intersection, right. put this kind of thing in. So and you're right. This happens to be inside of a rural residential area. Most of the others that I saw were just exactly that situation, approaching a village as you need to get from 90 to 50K. Yeah, very good point. Okay, well, just uh, there is that one in Virginia. Um, I, I was at the TRB, Transportation and Research Board Conference in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago. And just to conclude, I want to finish up with a few words, uh, a few things that I heard. And if we have, hope. what? A few words of hope. Yeah, right. Um, there was a, one of the sessions I went to was a group of American engineers representing different DOTs in Ashto went on a study tour of European signalized intersections. I spent about two weeks there, spoke to a lot of people, took lots of pictures, and one of the people who was there, I went up to him, asked for it, and I asked him about this treatment, and he told me there's absolutely nothing in the MUTCD of the vehicle code that says you couldn't do this in the United States. I thought that was pretty encouraging, that a lot of these treatments seem really outlandish, but there's nothing really prohibiting us from doing it. But let me tell you what I found absolutely shocking. There were five people up there, and they gave a presentation. The encouraging thing was that, no doubt in their minds, the message they got over and over again to make intersections safe was to slow traffic and design for pedestrians and bicyclists. They heard the message very often that you design first for the pedestrian and bicyclist. But what was shocking to me was to realize how shocked they were when the Europeans told them the first thing that we consider is safety. Now, what do you always hear from engineers in this country that they say is their first goal, right? But let me tell you, it is not very often the case. And the, p the pressures are political that in most cases capacity trumps safety. We will do things at intersections on roadways to improve capacity that we know are less safe. But the pressure of the political pressure to do that is absolutely incredible. So um, if there are any other thoughts we want to share in a few minutes of open discussion, that would be great. Uh, we're at 131 and 56 seconds according to that. So any final thoughts would be greatly appreciated and where we go with this. Michael, um, great presentation and Todd, uh, and I especially enjoy the sections about uh, the pedestrian malls and the, um, the shared roadways. Uh, a suggestion for future presentations is I'm fascinated with, with facilities where pedestrians and bikes share a facility and I know Europe has those. Asia has some amazing examples too. And uh, my feeling is we could be doing more in the U.S. and that we're sort of losing uh, a good chance in a lot of cases and having bikes and pedestrians fight each other instead of trying to come up with, with shared facilities. There's, there's that sharing word again. How would you like this format, by the way? Um, we wanted you to work, and I think uh, <laughs> we could have gone for two and a half hours easily. We had to stop you. So I hope that you appreciate the fact that we're expecting you to contribute your ideas. And Todd is writing all these down. And we heard quite a few new ones today, Todd, that we haven't heard in the previous two sessions. Yeah, we will be doing a synopsis. Yes. I just appreciate the time constraints and making sure we stop. Okay. Okay. We all want to hear more. We don't want to talk about the same thing all day. Right. We'll probably spend an hour and a half on the very first one, shared paths, right, I'm sure. Right. Okay. So you didn't feel too rushed? Um, I wonder, I'm not a bicyclist, whatever, I take the bus a lot, um, but you had a picture of this guy, well, I can't remember your name, Roger, um, and he was just sitting in the middle of the street waiting for, you know, the turn lane, and I would be scared, personally, I saw the speed limit sign was 30 miles an hour, that means people are going 35, 40, and you're just sitting in the middle of the street, I, that, I don't think that I would use that if it was there to even be used. I just, it, that just shows his dedication to wait for <laughs> Michael to take the photograph. Yeah, huh? I'm standing in the middle of the street with my camera taking a picture too. You know? <laughs> but yeah, you know, we had that exact same question the two other times we gave it. I, I wouldn't stand there in the middle of the street. Yeah, I think I better trust the drivers. Yeah. I, I think the discussion needs to have a little bit more maybe introduction as to whether it really does work in Holland and whether, because we're doing, they're obviously doing a lot of treatments, but I also know that Europeans are also driving more uh, than they have in the past. So, it's, so I, I think there's a lot of question about the traffic calming movement, whether it's a response to a, a bike pedestrian constituency or whether it's really a policy which is having uh, effects. We also didn't talk much about the topography of Holland, the fact that it's a relatively um, Thanks. <laughs> and uh, and so, so those, those are the things we should, and also perhaps. That's why I balanced it with Swiss flights. Switzerland yeah. is not flat. <laughs> In Rohnert Park, California, their bike lanes 
are delineated by an, a concrete hump that separates the bike lane from the road, and I loved that, and I've never felt safer as a cyclist. Is that just prohibitively expensive other places? No, that is actually one of the treatments we considered showing that we didn't do, and there are some areas in America where they do it, yeah. Um, the response to that, the, the classic one that we give at the DOT is it feels safe until you realize we just can't maintain those. And we used to have a few of those in the Portland area in the 70s, and they got so full of debris behind them that it actually became quite dangerous. Uh, we had a few examples where people would hit the curb, knock the curb into the bike lane, and it would stay there for three weeks before someone moved it. So it's, that's one thing that I'm surprised no one brought up is these take intensive maintenance. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be responsive sometimes within hours of an incident getting up there because we're talking about some really tight situations where the bicyclist has to aim for these little passages and cut throughs to make it work. So, yeah. One thing I'd like to, one, one thing I've seen in the Netherlands and other countries is the, um, a similar device, but it's um, plastic, it's rubber. It's, it's almost like a speed bump, but only half the width and half the height. And they use that to delineate in real tight spaces. That is mountable by a street sweeper. And perhaps you don't use it the entire length of the, the bike lane or the pinch point. You just use it at certain sections where you want to reinforce motorist behavior, perhaps maybe at just after and before intersections and other places where you see a lot of wearing of the bike lane by vehicles, you know, just kind of maneuvering. Yeah. Well, Robert, let's do part two next year because we only did about half of the subject areas that we considered. And Todd and I did a lot of, no, let's not do this one, let's not do that one. That was one of the ones we decided not to do. Um, and I think uh, Morgan was talking about this earlier. And I was a planning commissioner in Mountain View, California. And in the downtown street, they took the parking area, raised it slightly, gave it colored concrete. And so it's either used as parking or there are a lot of restaurants. So, you know, if you have this flexible space, if a you know, pet store becomes a restaurant, they want to do outdoor seating, you just sort of put planters around it and you have an outdoor seating area. Or if the weather's only good for that certain <coughs> times of the year. So. And that's the like comment you made. Shared spaces, different uses at different times. Just the other day we were having a discussion in Lincoln City about timing signals for left turns and things like that. And people point out, well, you work with ITS, right? You work with ITS, intelligent traffic signal systems. Why do we always have one system for all circumstances all the time, where different times of the year, different times of the day, it could operate differently? Someone talked about sidewalk cafes put out in the parking areas and then removed. Yeah. Um, really briefly, um, oh, about shared use, one, one thing I thought of was uh, sometimes I'm out in the suburbs, say in Highway 99 in Tigard or out in Gresham, and there'll be painted bike lanes. And, uh, but I'll see some c cyclists on the sidewalk rather than the bicycle lanes because you've got traffic going 45, 50 miles an hour and a lot of people don't feel safe and there's often debris. So in, in a way there's some shared use of pedestrian facilities by bicycles whether we condone it or not. But um, a basic question I have is almost a, or a concern is a chicken and an egg thing. Um, a little while ago there was a, a speaker from Britain who's working on their national bicycle network, I think Henderson Bailey. And he was saying he f considered it, if we really want to have more people bicycle, you have to design the system so that the novice cyclist feels safe on it. And uh, it strikes me that a lot of our bicycle system, although we have a very extensive map to bicycle system, is not the sort of system that you know mom, dad, and the kids feel safe going on. And so I don't. I want, it makes me wonder if we can get beyond just the serious cyclists really using the system, and if we, it wouldn't be better if we concentrated in a. In a a few critical corridors that that were built to a, I think a, a, a more a safer level, and um, but again to concentrate, spend a lot of money on really improved facilities, uh, uh, you need political support for. But uh, you know, without building for for a, a more mass audience, how do you get that support? Right. So you know, again, it's, it's you a difficult saw that issue. the Oregonian the other day on the Powell overcrossing, for example. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, there's, we're spending quite a bit of money on Powell improving an overcrossing there, and there's a pretty strong letter to the editor questioning why we're spending so much money on bikes. You know, it comes up all the time, so we hear both sides. Yeah, we'd love to do more, no doubt about it. And someone in the middle here mentioned the, the political will to to do that. You're right. Well, thank you all for coming, and to our uh, speakers.
Just as a side note, I noticed that a lot of the bicycles in the pictures weren't wearing helmets. On your phones, on top of the bike. No helmets? No. Except for children. Some really? yeah, a few. Do you have a lot of, you don't have a lot of head injuries or people don't really care? No, they don't fall off their bikes as much. I'm serious. Most head injuries are not people hit by cars. I noticed that right away was the, was the, the no helmets. Well, part of it's also...